And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is James Shubsky, COO of Margie's Outdoor Store, located deep within the Columbia River Gorge in Washington State. In 2022, his store initiated a paranormal reporting program, which has now received well over 100 reports of strange activities in the Gorge area. James, thank you for joining me and welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure, Jeff. You know, I have to, um, those talking points are actually a little bit outdated. Mm -hmm. um, we now have had well over 220 reports in the past year and a half. Mm. And it's uh, really been a remarkable experience. And uh, so, yeah, it's uh, pretty incredible. Was this your idea to start this program? Well, you know, um, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, so, um, you know, I... Uh, before 2021, I would have never considered myself any kind of paranormal investigator. And um, but uh, after a death in the family, uh, my wife and I moved down to the Columbia River Gorge um, because we had inherited a handful of small local businesses. And so we came down here um, to manage that family legacy. And uh, one of the stores that uh, we inherited wasn't doing really well. And I have a lot of experience as an outdoor adventurer. So I converted that uh, to an outdoor adventure store. And right away, uh, we people started coming in, uh, mostly locals, and they were telling us these truly amazing stories, uh, stories about encountering Sasquatch, about seeing UFOs. And I thought, wow, this is really remarkable. And so we decided to lean into it. Uh, I found it personally fascinating. And so we put up a big sign in the window. It said, file your paranormal reports here. And it listed, you know, Sasquatch sightings, UFO encounters, ghost experiences, time anomalies, you name it. And um, I have to tell you, it has been a an incredibly joyful, magical, wonderful experience. Um, it's sort of like, <laughs> you know, a couple times a week, a new Scooby-Doo mystery walks into our, through our door and um, we hear these really astonishing tales. You know, when we started this program, I really didn't know what to expect or where it would go or even what we'd do with the information. And now that uh, we've got uh, a lot of reports under our belt, we're starting to see some patterns and uh, starting to... Uh, recognize um, and trying to come up with some theories about what's going on out here. Um, I think it might be a good idea uh, for me to give you a little bit of background on myself and on the Columbia Gorge, um, just so you get a sense of where we are and uh, who I am and, and what's going on. Sure, that'd be great. So um, prior to moving to the Gorge, um, I am uh, a lifelong adventurer. Um, I had uh, I'm a highly decorated U.S. Army infantry veteran and uh, a uh, wildland forest firefighter, uh, search and rescue EMT, and a mountain guide. And so, you know, I have had a professional training in uh, wilderness endeavors uh, for basically my whole life. And so I'm very familiar with, um, A, the types of creatures that live in the wilderness, and be all the different dangers and types of things that are out there. And uh, and so when we had the opportunity to move to the Gorge, it was kind of like winning the lottery because the Gorge is truly one of the most amazing adventure areas in the world. So uh, the Columbia River is, the map behind me is sort of a depiction of uh, the area that I'm talking about. And the Columbia River Gorge is an 80 mile stretch. Um, it was actually, uh, it's so jaw-droppingly beautiful out here that back in the 1980s, the federal government, U.S. Congress, enacted a new law to protect it in a special way, and it became the first national scenic area in America. And it's basically has all the protections of a national park, but it allows for people to live there and businesses to operate there. And so it is a remarkable place. Now, you can see from the map behind me that half of the map is green and half of it is tan. 
Well, that's because right in the center of the gorge uh, runs the Cascade Mountains. And um, within, you know, 40 miles of my store, there are three strata volcanoes uh, that are over 10,000 feet. There's Mount St. Helens, which famously erupted in 1980. Uh, below, um, right where my heart is right now, there is uh, Mount Hood, which is a very famous uh, Bigfoot hotspot. And above my head is Mount Adams, also known as Portal Peak, which has uh, historically been a UFO hotspot. Um, and so on the eastern uh, side of the mountains, there's a, a rain shadow effect, and that's a high plains desert. And so you see all the classic things you'd expect to see, like uh, soaring cliffs and desert mesas, um, you know, sort of an open, barren landscape. But on the west side, it's a uh, Pacific Northwest rainforest that sees over 100 inches of rain a year. And the gorge um, was formed by some very unique and apocalyptic geologic forces. And uh, the east, uh, the western gorge has the highest concentration of waterfalls anywhere in the United States. Uh, there are over 80 waterfalls uh, on the Oregon side alone. Uh, because of all of this uh, amazing geologic activity that's happened out here, uh, the place is riddled with caves and, uh, like I said, uh, mm -hmm. islands and just this incredible adventure landscape. So, you know, we came down here and I thought, my gosh, this place is perfect. Um, and uh, we opened the outdoor store. Well, like I said, it's um, the number of reports that we've had. And, you know, of course, you know, these are people relating their personal experiences. and. Um, because of some experiences I've had myself, I instructed our employees that we were going to believe the witnesses. And sure, it's possible that we might have some people that come in or just pulling our leg or having a good time. And that's really, in my mind, no harm, no foul. But um, we want to take everybody seriously. And we want to treat them with dignity and respect. We want to ask intelligent follow-up questions. We don't want to insert what we believe they experienced. Um, on top of their experience, we want to take in the data and see what we get. And like I said, my heavens, um, we've had, like I said, easily over 220 reports in the last year and a half. And it's just been uh, an amazing uh, adventure. What are some of the patterns that you have started noticing? So, uh, of course, um, we, we get a lot of reports of Bigfoot and Sasquatch related uh, material. Um, really detailed information. You know, some people have brought in hair samples and the stories of Sasquatch uh, or Bigfoot-like creatures go way back um, to prehistory times. You know, there have been people, archeological evidence shows that people have been living here for well over 10,000 years, probably closer to 15,000 years. And the legends and petroglyphs of the area uh, reflect um, evidence of, of Sasquatch-like creatures. Uh, and so we know, for instance, certain areas that they're more prone to be spotted in. And uh, some of the, uh, one of the interesting things about Sasquatch is that a lot of people report uh, the ability to move extremely quickly. Some people seem to say that that's a, like a teleportation type of a thing uh, where they're able to move, you know, hundred yards in the blink of an eye. Uh, so Sasquatch phenomena, a big part of the culture here. You said hair samples were brought in? And if so, yeah, we, have they been studied? You know, we haven't studied them yet. And part of the problem is, is that I don't have a solid chain of custody. Uh, so like, where did that sample come from and everything else like that? Um, but, uh, you know, they brought them in and uh, the individual who's brought them in has reported that they travel to his property frequently. I think he believes that uh, his property is sort of a travel pinch point for them. Um, and so... We have the samples, of course, getting any kind of genetic analysis is an expensive endeavor. And so until I'm, I'm able to collect the samples myself, I'm unwilling to make that investment, you know, without being certain about all of the details of the collection of it. Is there anything in particular about the hair that would make you think it's different from any other animal hair? You know, um, it's hard to say, you know, there, uh, he brought in envelopes of single strands. And um, so it's kind of hard to say, according to this individual, uh, the young ones have fur um, and they're fuzzier. Uh, he's seen young ones and pregnant ones and adult ones and couples and all kinds of things. 
and then the older ones have hair uh, like uh, like we do. Uh, in his mind, um, this particular witness says that uh, he's seen them dozens of times, and he's convinced that they're a biological creature, but he's one of those individuals who says that they do seem to have that teleportation ability. I was wondering if you thought they were interdimensional beings, or is there some type of breeding population out there? Well, it seems really clear, based on all the reports we've had, that there is definitely a breeding population. Uh, like I said, um, we've had reports, pregnant ones, young ones, you know, the whole gamut. Um, my personal feeling after, you know, receiving all these different reports is they almost have to have some type of interdimensional qualities. And, you know, I'm uh, reluctant to say that because I don't have a good theory about how all that works. But when you look at the all of the evidence taken together, um, it really seems like they have uh, some type of ability to elude uh, many of our standard evidentiary techniques. You know, photographing them seems difficult, and uh, finding bodies seems very difficult. But by the same token, uh, the witness, the, you know, there have been over 800 reported sightings of Bigfoot in Washington State, and so. Um, and they're leaving physical evidence on the landscape, numerous, you know, footprints and hair samples and things like that. But where exactly they are, uh, hard to pin that down. And also, there's a very elusive nature about them, uh, where they seem to be able to phase in and out of our ability to see them. You know, as a soldier, I am very familiar with uh, how to camouflage yourself in the forest, right? And it was very easy for my entire platoon to hide and, you know, a 100 yard by 100 yard or even a 50 yard by 50 yard area and all 30 of us you could walk two feet away from us and you wouldn't have seen us and you know we just worked in the woods we didn't live there and so the ability to hide in the woods is um especially for a creature that lives there seems to me um very plausible that hard to see them but there's some elements of these stories that makes me think there's something more to it than that um so you had asked about these phenomenon. Uh, so again, the Bigfoot stories, very, very common. Um, we also have a number of UFO stories, UFO encounters. Um, and, you know, those date back to some of the very first flying saucer reports. Uh, you know, Kenneth Arnold back in June of 1947 was really sort of the first mainstream report of flying saucers. He was flying a private plane a little bit north of us, uh, he saw nine saucer-like objects. They were flying from the north to the south, and they were actually traveling from Mount Rainier to Mount Adams. And so from that early beginning, uh, there have always been UFO reports in the area. And we have had uh, many of those. Some report um, what seem to be traditional UFO-type craft, many of them. In fact, just today I received a new report about a triangular-shaped craft. Uh, and the desert area, uh, probably just above my shoulder over here. And um, we also receive reports of tic-tac-shaped objects, sort of like what you see on those uh, pilot cams and other types of craft. Uh, we do receive a number of reports that seem to be um, some type of advanced military aircraft, you know, black helicopters flying through the canyons out here that don't make any sound um, and other types of uh, vehicles which seem of human origin, but highly advanced. And then we also get many, many reports of glowing orbs. And my wife and I have seen these ourselves, and I was e actually able to capture a picture of one. Uh, if I can share a screen, yeah. I can show you what yeah, I'm talking about. That would be a great idea. Let's check it out. So um, earlier this year, we received a, uh, the photo. Here's the original up in the corner with the red circle over it. This was uh, taken about... Uh, four miles from the store. Uh, the person who took the photo was about 11 miles away from this mountain, which is called Underwood Mountain. Um, and so they sent this in and we did some image analysis. Uh, what you see in the uh, blue and sort of this orange looking images, a couple of different filters we applied to get uh, more clarity on what we were looking at. And then this one here in the lower corner is actually the images blown up. And um, here you can see uh, there's no obvious wings or rotors. Um, and we know the size of this mountain. And if it is, in fact, over that mountain, this is a fairly large object. Um, our analysis was inconclusive, uh, but it's definitely she captured something. And it's kind of hard to say exactly what it is, but it is clearly 
possibly uh, some type of craft. It's got that classic tic-tac shape. Now I talked about orbs and this is an image that I took myself. Um, this is probably, uh, it's actually right underneath Underwood Mountain. This big slope here is the beginning of Underwood Mountain. And um, I had stopped my car. And this is maybe, again, four miles from the store. I was looking at this beam of light and I had taken a number of images before and after uh, this image. They all show the beam of light, but this is the only one that shows this strange glowing orb. Now, um, this one was found after the picture was taken, but like I said, my wife and I have seen glowing orbs in the gorge, and we have dozens and dozens of reports of orbs witnessed with the naked eye. And so a team of photographic experts looked at this, and they determined that it's highly unlikely that this is a lens flare, and that's based on the images before and the images after and some of the characteristics of what was going on atmospherically at the time. Did you say that you took this photograph? I did, yes. Wow. How big do you think the orb is or was? You know, um, the ones that I have seen, you know, my wife and I have seen, we've seen at a distance, and it's very difficult to gauge their size. Now, we have had reports of ones... Um, and we don't know if this is a related phenomenon or a completely separate phenomenon. People have seen them in the forest and near some of the uh, larger monolithic rocks in the area. And some of those are, you know, maybe uh, less than two feet in diameter. Other people have seen them, you know, there's this giant rock called Beacon Rock. Um, let me see if I can show you a picture of Beacon Rock here. So this is Beacon Rock. It is the cold core of an extinct volcano. And it's 840 feet tall. There's actually a trail pinned to the side of these cliffs, and you can get up to the top of it. Uh, a fairly easy hike, about 45 minutes. Uh, a woman reported to me that she saw a glowing orb flying from the west to the east. It got to the uh, to the side of the probably at a 300 foot level, so about um, sort of right here in this area. And then when it got to the rock, it immediately turned 90 degrees and uh, vertically shot up into the sky and disappeared. Um, yeah, so again, numerous reports of this type of glowing orb phenomenon, uh, you know, lens flare would be my first reaction. Like I said, we had a team of photographic experts. They kind of ruled that out for the image that I had taken. And, uh, it also is, um, problematic. Uh, obviously a person's eyeball doesn't create a lens flare. Uh, we've had folks think that it might be ball lightning of some type. A spirit medium looked at this image and told me that he believed, uh, his spirit guides were informing him that this was a vehicle of some type. Again, um, I'm not saying that I know what these things are. And what I am saying is that we are encountering just this enormous volume of um, so-called paranormal uh, phenomena here in the gorge. There's a number of theories about why that might be. Um, but part of the reason why I'm going on shows like yours is I'm inviting people with more uh, experience in researching this phenomenon to come out to the gorge and uh, take a look at some of these things and uh, conduct more thorough investigations. You know, obviously with that volume, it's something I can't manage myself. And so, you know, people who are more experienced investigators or who are intuitive and have other ways of understanding and knowing the world, uh, we would love for them to come visit and try to make sense of what's going on out here. Um, so the orbs, um, what I broadly would categorize as this UAP phenomenon, the uh, anomalous, um, what do they call it, uh, aerial phenomenon, or um, uh, that type of stuff is that we see a lot of that. And um, again, there's some patterns that we're recognizing within that. Um, we have had reports of portals, you know, what appear to be areas of the sky that um, are different than the sky surrounding it. Um, we've had reports of uh, small humanoids. Uh, again, that's one that is difficult for me to wrap my head around. Um, but again, we take our witnesses uh, for their word. And, you know, as I research a phenomenon like small humanoids, um, I look at the Native American stories of the area and uh, little people uh, figure prominently in, in many of their stories. And one of the most interesting things, this is something that we have received uh, about 70 reports on is 
We have had numerous reports of an enormous Black Panther-like creature uh, that has been uh, reported here in the Gorge area for nearly 40 years. So um, we call this creature the Klickitat Ape Cat. Uh, so my store is located in Klickitat County, and the first reports came from Klickitat County, and the bulk of the reports come from this area. And uh, so all, everyone that we have talked to uh, reports seeing a very large, very muscular black cat uh, with a long black tail. Now, about half of those reports say that the creature is enormous in size. So by that, I mean four to five feet tall at the shoulder. So that is larger than a tiger, which is the largest known cat in the world. Uh, there's only one creature in the fossil record that matches that, and it's a creature called the Panthera atrox, which was a Ice Age cat that lived in Washington State 10,000 years ago, and it's said to have gone extinct. But um, this creature, they found numerous skeletons of it. Uh, they're fairly certain that it was over a thousand pounds, um, stood four to five feet tall at the shoulder, and interestingly had the largest uh, brain of any cat known to have ever existed, both in total volume and as a ratio to its body weight. Um, and then there are a handful of reports that say the creature has a monkey, has a face that looks like a monkey. And when I heard that, it was um, eye opening. You know, again, uh, we try to take our witnesses' um, word for what they've experienced. And this particular, the, the first time I heard about it, um, the very first report we ever received of this cat came from an individual. And he reported seeing this cat-like face, and he had spent uh, five minutes looking at it. He was orienteering uh, probably four or five miles from the store area called Buck Creek, and his compass started acting strange. He looked up, and across the creek, he saw this enormous black cat creature. He said it had long black fur, four to five inches long. He said it was sticking straight out from its body. That long tail, very muscular, four to five feet tall at the shoulder. And he said it had a face um, that looked like a monkey. Subsequent reports have said that um, the creature has like a flattened face. So if you imagine the difference between like a German Shepherd and a pug dog, they're both dogs, but one of them's face is much flatter. Um, whether it's actually a monkey, I don't know, but that first witness was adamant. He said that it had numerous, you know, primate-like features, including intelligent ape-like eyes. Eventually, with this encounter, um, the creature showed no signs of hostility. In fact, none of the reports we received uh, have any kind of negative or hostile encounter. And then the creature turned and then disappeared into the forest. Um, so that was the first report that I had received of it. And normally we don't do a lot with a single report. This witness was credible for numerous reasons. Uh, you know, we there are some things that we use to evaluate the credibility of witnesses, and it has to do with how they tell their stories and, you know, whether they remain consistent through questioning and things of that nature. This person was also a friend of the family who'd known my mother-in-law, Margie, uh, before she passed away. And um, so it, 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 at the time that I heard the story, I thought, mm, this is interesting. Um, not sure if there's anything to do with it, right? It's a single account, credible witness, but a lot of um, very uh, bizarre description of a creature that you know we had never heard of before. Well, the very next day, I was talking to my employees about this report, and one of them started shaking. And Missy said, oh, my God, James, I've seen that creature myself. I was driving down Klickitat Canyon, uh, which is sort of, again, over my shoulder here. And um, it was early in the morning, and I saw this creature prowling along the side of the road. She said it was enormous. And she even stopped her car to watch it. It wandered into a small patch of tall grass, and she waited, and it never came out seems to have disappeared. Um, and so she began to tell her family about it. And they all kind of nervously laughed at her. They told her that she had probably seen a cow. And so that gives you a sense as to just how large this creature was. And after that fairly negative experience, you know, with people that she trusted and loved, um, sort of not believing her, thinking she was crazy, telling her she saw something different than what she actually saw. She kind of kept that story to herself. And when I related the description of the creature to her, um, she started shaking because it was uh, this validating moment for her. And um, 
So at that point, with two what I would consider highly credible witnesses corroborating stories, um, I decided to um, you know start asking around. Uh, so with the store, we've got a radio advertising budget, and we asked uh, you know we put out a radio ad asking if anyone had seen it. I put up um, flyers at the trailheads asking you know if, has anyone seen this creature? Well, we started getting tons of reports, and uh, now that number is like I said. Uh, eking up into the 70s, uh, some of we've had senior law enforcement officials tell us that they've seen the creature. Uh, the stories go back uh, nearly 40 years, and uh, like I said, they all describe this enormous black cat creature. Um, not everyone says that it's large, and not everyone says that it has a face like a monkey, but I am convinced that there is um, some some type of creature out there now. About well. A week and a half ago, um, on a local Facebook group, uh, one of these kind of closed community group Facebook groups, someone posted a video of a large cat-like creature prowling, or prowling around on their property. And right now I'm in the process of uh, contacting that person and we're setting up a time for me to go visit their location and uh, take a look at it. The video was posted on Facebook and Facebook degrades the quality. It's very clear that they've captured some type of Blackford creature, uh, they describe it as having cat-like movements and, you know, because they were eyewitnessing it and a long tail. Um, and again, I'm not sure that this video is going to be absolutely conclusive proof, um, but we'll investigate it. Um, but it has uh, inspired me. Uh, we're just about to offer a $1,000 reward for anyone who can bring in authentic video footage of the creature. That's awesome. Have you ever got any reports with UFOs combined with Sasquatch or this cat or anything else? <laughs> well, you know, um, there seems to be a relationship between those two things. Oftentimes where one is cited, the others are cited. Um, in terms of direct uh, connections, like, you know, Sasquatch jumped out of a UFO, we haven't heard that, that story. Interestingly, uh, about 25 minutes north of my store in a town called Trout Lake, there is a place called Iseti Ranch. Iseti stands for uh, Enlightened Contact with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And, uh, James Gilland, Gilliland, um, he's been uh, doing this for decades, and he's you know been on numerous shows and things like that. And people come from all over the world to James's ranch, and um, you know you can pay, I think it's fifty bucks, and bring your own lawn chair, sit on his, in his you know on his property, and watch ufos fly around mount adams all night long and so people come skeptics and they leave believers and so there's been numerous reports of that they claim to be in contact with uh numerous um i call them like i think that they're i don't know if they call them aliens from another planet you know they are definitely non-human or non-earthly origin uh, races of beings one of the most prominent is a race of feline humanoids and uh, they claim to be in contact with them in fact their logo has got a, a lion's head on it uh, in representation and honor of that particular tradition so there may be some relationship there now i haven't had a chance to talk with james directly um he's a uh he's a very busy man and he's got a lot uh, going on up there at his ranch um but so that may be one area where there's a connection between these cats and um you know, some type of non-earthly race of beings. It's fascinating that you mentioned the feline female humanoid because I had a guest once here down in Texas that he encountered a feline type of human ET. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, once we started getting these reports of this cat, I began doing research, you know, is there anything in, you know, Native American stories? And it turns out there's a, uh, the Native Americans of the, Great Lakes area uh, refer to a race of what they call supernatural panther protectors. Um, so a race of underwater panthers. And when you're hearing Native American stories, oftentimes when you hear about something from the an underwater creature or a sky realm creature or something from inside of the earth, you're talking about a being that has one foot in the spirit world or another dimension and one foot in our physical world that we know every day. The interesting thing about these creatures called the Meshepishu, 
is that they they're described as a black panther with the face of a man and uh so there is this uh, connection between interdimensional panther creatures with you know i guess ape or human like faces and here in the columbia river gorge we have uh, numerous petroglyphs and there are some places where you know you can see dozens of them you know within you know, a quarter of a mile and uh, one of those images, in fact, I, I have a picture of it here, seems to depict a, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so this is, uh, seems to depict a cat-like face uh, with wavy water lines underneath its head. And no one can say for sure exactly what this is representing. Um, but um, it's clear that people may have been encountering a beast like the one we're talking about. Uh, for millennia and uh so very interesting connection there again there's a lot that we don't know how old is this petroglyph it's impossible to say they know that it may be at least a thousand years old so the dating of these things is difficult to do because there's no organic material with them and so it's hard to get a, a clear date on them but um yeah and so the Received wisdom from the archaeological community is that these are easily a thousand years old. Um, but, you know, they could be anywhere. They could be just 250 years old. In any case, it's definitely a part of the culture, you know, the what the Native Americans were experiencing and felt was important enough to record in stone. Um, and so, you know, again, we don't know. Now, um, the, the, the thing about, so of course we have cougars that live out here, right? And, um, but we talk to wildlife biologists, specialists, and they all say that, um, first of all, cougars are not supposed to be black. There's no scientific recognition that there's any such thing as a black cougar. The only large big cat uh, that's black in North America is the jaguar and its range is a thousand miles south of uh, Washington state. So, um, we also know that there are no creatures that are that large, uh, no cats that are that large. And so what this thing is, is kind of a mystery. Um, there's a really interesting theory that it may have escaped from a government testing facility at the Hanford nuclear site, which is just upriver from us. Are there any MUFON investigators in your area? And if not, have you ever considered becoming one? You know, I haven't been in contact with them. You know, I have looked at their website and, uh, you know, and it's been helpful. Um, apparently, Washington State, according to their site, is uh, either number one or number two in terms of UFO sightings per capita. And so we definitely have a lot going on here. And part of, again, these interviews that I'm going on is I'm trying to connect with other folks who are more experienced investigators, uh, you know, inviting them to contact me. Um, you can come to uh, my website, margiesoutdoor.com or look for Margie's Outdoor Store on you know, Instagram and Facebook and YouTube, or write to email uh, staff at margiesoutdoorstore.com. And I'd be happy to you know, connect with anyone who's uh, a serious researcher to sort of get to the bottom of um, what what's going on in all this phenomenon we've had here. Have any television shows or filmmakers been out there investigating? Yeah, um, we've had a few folks come out, I and mean, I've been interviewed by a few local uh, TV stations. And uh, there's a, some filmmakers in Portland who recently created an excellent Bigfoot documentary called, um, I think, Bigfoot, A Flash of Beauty, Bigfoot Revealed. And they're just now about to release their um, uh, the sort of follow-up uh, documentary to that. Uh, and so uh, I'm becoming good friends with those folks. Um, I think the guy from Sasquatch Chronicles and the Confessionals podcast, they came out with the film crew and spent some time with me. But I welcome anyone uh, with a camera or a YouTube channel uh, to come out. I'd be happy to conduct interviews, show folks around, and uh, point people to where uh, the most interesting hotspots are. Are you at a point in your life now where, for you, all this stuff is real? It's not just speculation. Well, I can tell you 100%, I am certain that this big black cat exists. 
no question in my mind. And really, that's the reason why I'm putting up a thousand dollar reward for video evidence of it. Um, I I believe that you know if we can um, incentivize people to bring that footage in, uh, we'll quickly have evidence that that, that thing exists. Um, I've seen the orbs with my own eyes, and you know I've taken that picture of it. Again, it's it's impossible. I would say in this day and age, you can fake any kind of video, right? There's no image that you can produce. There's no video that you can't you can produce that you know couldn't someone couldn't say it's fake or is AI generated or whatever. I mean, special effects are at that level. Um, but based on my personal experience, I am certain that the people of the gorge are experiencing a wide range of phenomena. And um, the reality of it, you know, these are good, honest people. And in fact, that was kind of the most unexpected, joyful piece of this whole thing was that, you know, people would come in and they would share these astonishing stories. It seemed like either everyone who's lived here for some time has had an experience like this or knows someone who has. And to me, that just makes this a truly enchanted, wondrous place to live. Um, and, you know, if you, um, you could think that the whole world is understood and known, and it's all just a matter of mop up for science to figure everything out. I don't think that's at all the case, you know, based on what we're seeing down here, you know, in my estimation, there may be out of the 220 reports you've had, maybe five or 10 people that were just joking around or having a good time, whatever, but everyone else. Um, was pretty earnest and pretty, pretty serious and no reason to lie. There's, you know, some of these stories are not very exciting or dramatic. And you know, I was driving my ATV and a big black hat jumped across the trail and scared the crap out of me and I never saw it again. And that's the whole story. And it's just the same kind of story you would hear if someone had seen a bear or a deer. And so um, I am, I'm certain that there are strange things afoot here in the gorge, um, that there's a reality here. We have many theories about why that might be the case. Um, and uh, but it's in my mind truly a mystery. We don't know. And that's part of what I love about it. Do you feel that there's something about that area geologically that makes it prone to all these sightings? Well, I have to tell you, this is one of the most geologically unique places on earth. Um, some of your listeners may be familiar with the work of Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson, who talked about these great ice age floods that happened out here. Well, that's only half the story. So 15 million years ago, this enormous fissure opened in the earth at the Washington, Idaho border. This thing was 106 miles long and enormous volumes of lava started erupting out of it. This is like Kilauea lava. And, it, but it's Kilauea literally times 10,000. And so much lava spewed out of this enormous apocalyptic fissure in the earth that it washed across Washington state and flowed 300 miles through what is now the gorge all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So much lava came out of this fissure that if you distributed across the entire United States, it would have buried the United States 60 feet deep across the entire continent. So, but it didn't all erupt at a single point. It um, started 15 million years ago and spanned for you know, probably two or 3 million years. And so some of these eruptive events were, and they estimate there were over 300 of them, uh, are separated in time by close to 100,000 years. Well, as that lava cooled, the iron grains within the uh, lava material, the molten rock, oriented to the Earth's magnetic pole at that time right? So um, it's cooling, the, the grains all orient to the magnetic north, and then it's locked into place. Well, the Earth's magnetic field is, all, or magnetic pole is wandering. In the last 100 years, it's moved 700 miles. And since the 1970s, it's been moving 30 miles a year. And so every time that lava flowed and cooled, the Earth's magnetic pole was in a different location, and the magnetic grains were locked into a different position. And so we've got this layer cake of rocks, and you can see them along the gorge as you go through. And each one of those layers has got a different magnetic orientation to it. You add to that fact that the Columbia River Gorge um, has got, I think, 14 dams on it, uh, hydroelectric dams. 
they produce 40% of the country's hydroelectric power. And so you've got all these high, all these high power transmission lines running through the area. Um, and so if, if when you look on government navigational charts, there are bright pink letters that warn your magnetic compass readings will be off when you're traveling through this area. It's a known fact that we've got this extremely complicated and nuanced electromagnetic environment. You add on to that the fact that there are we've got these mountains that have risen up. And you know they they began their activity about five million years ago, and so you've got this very strong vertical movement, and then the whole um, Washington State is slowly twisting uh, in a clockwise motion, and it's sort of creating all these folds and wrinkles in the landscape itself. So again, it's this incredibly complicated and nuanced electromagnetic environment. Now, if you look at the doc, work of um, Dr. Michael Persinger who was a professor up in Ontario, he was able to dramatically alter human perception by placing um, magnetic uh, fields in different um, orientations around the human brain. Uh, he created a thing called the God Helmet. There's a lot of um, studies on it and you know a lot of literature, um, peer-reviewed literature based on that. But he was able to induce uh, the sensation of a sense of presence. Um, some people claim to have experienced God uh, and a whole range of interesting effects. Now, some people might dismiss that as saying, oh, he's just inducing hallucinations. I don't think that's accurate. Um, I think what was actually happening is that the human mind has sort of got a, uh, a bandwidth of perception. Like we can see in the visible light spectrum, but we can't see infrared, we can't see ultraviolet, we can't hear things that dogs can hear. And so we actually have sort of a very limited perceptive mode, and we call that normal reality. What I think may have been happening is that uh, as these people were exposed to these um, very low-powered but complex magnetic fields, their perceptive abilities were shifting, and they were able to perceive things that we don't normally perceive. Um, so again, because so much of the phenomenon here in the gorge seems to leave a physical trace, whether it be footprints or hair samples or photographic evidence, what I think is uh, happening is that there are beings or entities that may live um, in a parallel space that's outside of our normal perception. And there's something about the electromagnetic environment here in the gorge, which is wildly unique and different and highly textured and complicated that is um, two things may be happening. One is that people's perception may be shifting so that they can see it, or it's allowing those creatures to move from their native realm into our physical realm and interact here. Again, these are theories and, and I'm not a particle physicist or a psychologist or any of those kind of things. And so I don't know, but I do know that we've got this really unique environment. There's some really strange things going on here electromagnetically. Uh, that's all verified by real science. And we have this way over indexing on all of this so-called paranormal experiences that people are having here. So I think it's related to that. Um, and again, I'd love for better researchers than me to come down and, and investigate those ideas. Your theories make a lot of sense to me. I'm wondering if there are energy vortexes in the region as well, like that are commonly talked about in the Sedona, Arizona region. Well, I do believe that there are. Um, so the Columbia River has been flowing here for between 17 and 20 million years, right? And so this is an extremely persistent flow of energy. Now, like I said, that may sound like a woo-woo kind of, oh, energy is moving through the area kind of thing. but in a very real sense, that energy is being captured by the dams and turned into a form of energy that we use every day, electricity, right? And so the notion that there's energy flowing through here is 100% grounded in like hardcore engineering physics, right? So you've got that flow of energy that's been flowing here for millions and millions of years as an extremely um, well-worn momentum on that. And then there's also great winds that flow through here. This place is considered the windsurfing capital of the world because of the incredible winds and you know people get out on, on the river and do that. And so you've got that, that very real energy. And everyone who comes to the gorge, if you 
just stop and quiet your mind for a moment, you can feel it. Like it is a palpable sensation of movement. Um, it, you don't even have to be spiritually sensitive. You can feel it, uh, especially in some of the places of power. Like there's this place called Horse Thief's Butte. From the road, it looks like a normal desert mesa. But you get up into it, and it's riddled with a labyrinth of hidden passageways and amphitheaters. There's petroglyphs on the walls. You can climb to the top of it and see the expanse of the river. Um, and this is a place that for millennia has been a place of power. There are, you know, these rock nests, basically, where Native Americans went and had vision quests and, you know, spiritual adventures. And so it's really, really clear that there are places like that. And, you know, we looked at Beacon Rock. Well, so you've got that very strong horizontal energy flowing through the area. And then Beacon Rock uh, was a volcano that was active 57,000 years ago. And that's this very strong vertical energy, you know, sort of intersecting that horizontal energy. And it's creating this really unusual and unique energetic environment. Again, you know, I am, I'm not a scientist and then don't want to pretend to be one, but if you're here, you feel it. And, you know, people say, oh, the gorge is a magical place. You know, Congress created a law to protect it. It was the first place it was ever designated as a national scenic area because it is so jaw-droppingly beautiful here. But I don't think it's just the visuals that people are responding to. I think that there is something energetically going on that is resonating uh, on a spiritual or soul level or on a, you know, if you want to get into it, like an electrochemical or electromagnetic level on, on people's brains. And it, you come here and you you're just blown away by it. And um, so, it, and I think that that's contributing all of these different factors of this very unique environment contributing to these uh, high incidence of reports. I feel like this area probably has more activity than Skinwalker Ranch. And would you consider the gorge ground zero for Bigfoot and UFO activity? You know, um, yeah, I consider the... Columbia River Gorge area, the supernatural capital of the Pacific Northwest, um, without a doubt, you know, there, um, and I don't think it's been reported, like, a lot of the, like, people have reports up by Mount St. Helens, or, and what people don't recognize is this is a fairly compact area. The gorge is 80 miles long, and for me, the phenomenon sort of extends from Mount Adams, which is in the map above my head, to uh, Mount Hood, which is um, right beneath my chest on the map there. And so this area that you're looking at, you know, just like the number of incidents per square mile. And I know that even though I've had this astonishing number of over 220 paranormal reports, in fact, we got two today, um, that that is a fraction of the actual number of uh, phenomena that people are experiencing here. Like there's, we're, it's way underreported. And just when I talk to the locals, it's really clear that, you know, it's just a part of living here that you're going to be encountering Sasquatch or UFO. Uh, so many people have seen them. And I haven't even gotten into, you know, uh, the Dalles, which is right above my shoulder right here in that little dip in the river. That was the end of the Oregon Trail. And the number of ghost stories that come out of that place, you know, hauntings in the old hotels and the old jailhouses. Um, there's a Pioneer Cemetery. There's even this place that was a tuberculosis ward that was later turned into a sanitarium for the non-criminally insane like the like i said we didn't even touch on the it's a not a ghost town it's a freaking ghost metropolis like there's so many reports going on out there and how all these things are related i don't know but it is clear that there's something about this environment that is making it super prone to people reporting these experiences how is the hospitality industry out there if people want to travel and stay and check it out well um so hood river which is um the town of hood river i should say is there's a bridge that connects hood river to bingen uh right across from me and uh there are numerous hotels there uh it's kind of a vacation spot like i said it's the windsurfing capital of the world and so they cater to that crowd quite a bit numerous campsites um it is a it is a rural area i'm, I'm not going to lie to you i mean the columbia river gorge is a thin ribbon of humanity in a vast vast very rugged wilderness. But in the town where I live of Stevenson, there's a four-star resort uh, called Skamania Lodge. Uh, they've got lots of cool things like zipline courses and all that kind of stuff. 
there are river boats, paddle boats that go up and down the river and people can take tours on these paddle boats. Um, and like I said, there's, uh, I think, a company called Under Canvas, which sort of pioneered that whole glamping idea where you go and stay in these luxury tents. Uh, I think that they're building a brand new location um, just a little bit north of our store. And so uh, it's a great place to visit. That's awesome. Well, James, before we finish up here, can you leave us with one last positive message about the gorge? I would say um, for me, what has been so joyful and so beautiful about this experience is that it has reminded me that there are still wondrous, magical places in the world, that there are still places where mysteries abound. And um, there's more than just this physical world of things banging against each other. There's something here that is uh, enchanting and beautiful, and it's available to everyone. And so I hope that people come out and play with me in this amazing wonderland. James, thank you for that message, and thank you for being my guest. Oh, it was my pleasure, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.